Welcome to the inaugural Suran, Surin Pitsuan Lecture in Thai Politics and Society. I'm Jay Rosengard. I teach at the Harvard Kennedy School and I'm director of the Thai Studies Program. For those of you who don't know anything about the Thai Studies Program, it was um, originally started with some seed funding from the um, Ministry of Foreign Affairs of Thailand to support language instruction at very different levels. This was before the 2014 coup. Since the coup, we have received no money from the government of Thailand. Um, but that initial seed money was uh, supplemented by substantial private sector donations, which allowed us to create an endowed professorship of Thai studies, um, the annual Stanley Tambaya lecture, um, named after the late professor, Stanley Tambaya, and the Surin Pitsuan lecture in Thai politics and society. Um, a little bit about this lecture. To commemorate the first anniversary of the passing of Dr. Surin Pitsuan, and to celebrate his memory and his many achievements, as well as his generous support for the Thai Studies program at the Harvard University Asia Center, we renamed our Thailand at Harvard lecture series, which had been running for several years, to the Surin Pitsuan Lecture in Thai Politics and Society. And this is the inaugural lecture under the new name. Dr. Surin's many stellar accomplishments reflect a lifetime of public service as he endeavored to make Thailand, Southeast Asia, and our global community more just and prosperous. Most notably as Foreign Minister of Thailand and Secretary General of ASEAN, the Association of Southeast Asian Nations. We are particularly proud of the fact that Dr. Surin was a distinguished and beloved Harvard alumnus. Not only did Dr. Surin earn both a master's degree and a doctoral degree at Harvard, but he remained a vibrant and dedicated member of Harvard's extended family long after he graduated. And Dr. Surin's last public talk at Harvard was the 2017 Tsai Lecture in this very room at the Harvard um, Asia Center, and it was on the 50th anniversary of ASEAN. So 1967, ASEAN was created in Bangkok with the Bangkok Declaration. 2017, October 2017, we had a full day conference to commemorate the 50th anniversary, and the afternoon before, to kick off the events, Dr. Surin delivered the Tsai um, lecture. Although Dr. Surin's modesty would certainly have afforded him some embarrassment at naming a lecture after him, but it is in the same spirit of humility that we offer this token of our enormous gratitude and appreciation for Dr. Surin's central role in the genesis of the Thai Studies program at um, the Asia Center of Harvard University. And this is not an exaggeration to say that the program would not have come into existence without his leadership, vision, and dedication, for all of which we remain internally indebted. And I'm also very, very um, happy to note that two of Dr. Surin's sons have been able to join us from very far away. So we have Fuadi Pitsuan and Husni Pitsuan, please. And uh, Fuadi has agreed to say a few words on behalf of the Pitsuan family. So and I, I also have to say that um, my former student and teaching fellow is well on his way to completing his doctorate in international relations at Oxford. So Fuadi. It has been one year and four months since my father passed away. And it was one year and five months ago that he was here giving his last lecture at Harvard in this very same room and very same spot that I'm standing on right now. My father, as, as most of you would agree, uh, was a larger than life figure. Yet, in some sense, he was a man of many contradictions. He was a liberal among his conservative colleagues. 
He was a champion of democracy and human rights in a region that prides itself on strongman leadership. He was a Muslim that was respected even by Buddhist monks. He was a southern boy who has made his mark in Bangkok's politics. He walked and bike barefoot to his primary school every morning, but ended up with a PhD from Harvard. He was a scholar of political science, but he was also a practitioner of politics. And most importantly, he was a father and a friend to me. But such contradictions are qualities that I believe any great statement should have. They demonstrated my father's willingness to compromise and his ability to compromise, uh, to, to empathize. And if we were to overcome the polarization that is pitting liberal smarks against conservative trolls today, <laughs> these are the leadership qualities that are extremely important. What we need now are not hyperbolic claims to save the country out of the abyss or outlandish threats that would suppress free thinking. But rather, we need a radical centrist or a militant moderate, as a John Michael Hersfeld once told me about. Such idealism uh, with a sense of pragmatism was embodied by my father. And it is why he was so dearly missed by his friends. Those who did not know my father would, may not believe what I have just said, and you do not need to. His championship of the Thai study program and his unyielding belief in academic freedom should provide ample proof. It has been his wish that Harvard be a place where Thai affairs and its leadership get scrutinized and where innovative ideas for the, for the underprivileged get proposed. And so far, the Thai study program has lived up to that expectation. I congratulate Ajahn J. Rosengard and Ajahn Michael Hersfeld, who's not here today, for their journey that began some 14 years ago. I would like to also <laughs> congratulate Ajahn Malavika Reddy uh, for her appointment to the Thai study program. And I'm thankful to all those involved, including the bipartisan group of donors and all the staff at the Asia Center uh, for bringing the program to fruition and running it today. I'm particularly grateful and humble that there is now a lecture series named after my father. And no one else is more appropriate to give this first lecture than Ajahn Tidinan, who my father respected so dearly. Ajahn Tidinan's astute observation on both Thai politics and regional affairs was a significant influence on how my father maneuvered the Thai elite politics and also regional dynamics. I look forward to what Ajahn Tidinan has to say about the ongoing political drama that is putting our country at a stalemate. I hope that the Surin Pistawan lecture series continue to be a forum where we can discuss all matters relating to Thai politics and society. <coughs> and today is a wonderful start. And I trust that Harvard will safeguard this academic freedom that is so lacking in Thailand as an honor to my father. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Fuadi, for those moving words. Fuadi is clearly his father's son in the very best way. Thank you. Um, a little bit about our esteemed um, guest speaker, Ajahn Titinan. So um, Dr. Titinan is director of the Institute of Security and International Studies. <coughs> and yes, the acronym is ISIS, as we've joked about <laughs> before. Uh, but he said ISIS lost and we outlasted them, so we're keeping our name. So, uh, uh, he's also Associate Professor of International Political Economy at the Faculty of Political Science at Chulalongkorn University in Bangkok. He has authored a wide range of articles, books, and book chapters on Thailand's politics, political economy, and foreign policy, as well as ASEAN and East Asian geopolitics and geoeconomics. His many opinion articles have appeared in international and local media, including CNN, BBC, Financial Times, International New York Times, Nikkei Asian Review, Wall Street Journal, Bloomberg, it goes on and on. He also writes a regular column in the Bangkok Post and the Straits Times. In short, he is a 
high profile, widely respected public intellectual. He received his BA in International Relations from the University of California at Santa Barbara. Um, his MA in International Economics and International Relations from the Johns Hopkins School of Advanced International Studies, SICE. And his PhD in International Political Economy or Economics from the London School of Economics, where his work on the political economy of the 1997 Thai economic crisis, the Tom Yang Gung crisis, um, was awarded the United Kingdom's best dis dissertation prize in comparative and international politics, which you don't see in the bio that we handed out, is that while he was working um, on his dissertation and during this crisis, he was actually here at Harvard um, on a Harvard Yenching PhD scholarship from 1996 to 1999, I believe. So in a way, this is a bit of a homecoming for you, so welcome back. In June 2015, he received an award for excellence in opinion writing from the Society of Publishers in Asia, also known as SOPA. And in March 2018, he was chosen as an ASEAN at 50 fellow sponsored by New Zealand's Ministry of Foreign Affairs and Trade. Um, Dr. Titinan has held visiting positions at the Johns Hopkins School of Advanced International Studies, alma mater, Stanford, um, also Yangon University in Myanmar, Victoria University, New Zealand, Dumingan University in Germany, and he has lectured at many local and overseas universities. He also currently serves on the editorial boards of International Relations of Southeast Asia, Southeast Asia Research, Asian Politics and Policy, and Journal of Current Southeast Asian Affairs. Um, and I should add that um, Fuadi mentioned how close we were to Dr. Surin, and last July, July 2018, um, Dr. Titinan organized a beautiful tribute to both uh, Dr. Surin and ASEAN, where you had people from all the ASEAN countries um, assemble very senior people um, in order to um, commemorate. Uh, Dr. Sudan. So um, we are very much, I, I can't, if I, if I keep telling you about all he's done, he won't have any time to talk, so I will stop. Um, we are very much looking forward to your talk. Elections, coups, and constitutions, Thailand's reckoning and regional perspective, and we hope that you will help us to navigate the turbulence of Thailand's first, well, election using the term loosely, since um, it's 2014 military coup. The floor is yours. Okay. Welcome. Thank you. Swadikrab, uh, Swadikrab, Swadipi Mai Thai. Happy Songkran New Year, Happy Thai New Year, <coughs> and Happy Easter to uh, to those who celebrate Easter. Happy Easter in advance. Um, I have just a few things to say before I begin my my talk. Uh, Professor Jay, thank you very much for a kind introduction. Uh, Professor Jay Rosengar and I share a namesake. Uh, for him, it's a real name. For me, it's a nickname. But uh, the name Jay is very important to, to both of us. Um, I also want to thank the, the Thai Studies program here. I, I wasn't sure if it, you know, this is Harvard Asia Center, but the Thai Studies program. And you, you know, it's gone unrecognized. But uh, normally, when you talk about Thai studies back in the 60s, 70s, 80s, the places to do Thai studies or Southeast Asian studies would be Cornell, uh, maybe Michigan, uh, NIU. Um, you know, South Carolina, Arizona, but now, now, I did not know until recently that Harvard has a leading Thai studies program, and I hope that uh, Harvard will be able to sustain it and build on it. I hope it will be the, the center of attraction for Thai studies and Southeast Asia studies uh, from around the world. Uh, I also would say that uh, I'm very thankful for Harvard, uh, not just the university, but uh, a place on Divinity Avenue, number two. Uh, I just went there to pay my homage. I have not been on campus for 20 years, uh, and I didn't, couldn't find my way. And thanks to uh, uh, our assistant, our coordinator, Kun Montita, uh, it looks the same. Uh, my colleague, uh, Dr. Pung Tong, uh, is based there uh, for, the, for the time being. Uh, the Harvard Jenching Institute. I'm very grateful to the Harvard Jenching Institute for giving me a scholarship to do my PhD. Uh, I'm eternally grateful that uh, not only that, 
uh, and he gave me a P PhD scholarship to study in the UK. So I, did, I, I used Harvard's money, but I studied at the London School of Economics where I wanted to go to school, because uh, I thought that was the best place to study international political economy. Am I okay on the microphone? I'm sorry, that, 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 that this one is okay too? Um, so the Harvard Yenching Institute, I cannot thank enough. Uh, I used to get my checks from the Harvard Management Company. So uh, a little bit about Dr. Serene Pisawan. I mean, Professor Jay Rosengard talked about the event we held uh, in commemoration of your father, your late father, and uh, what a great life he had. And uh, you know, it was uh, cut short. But uh, at that at that event, uh, who's need join us? He was our uh, guest of honor. He was the last uh, speaker. And uh, I'll just say a couple of things about uh, Dr. Serene Pisawan. Uh, he passed on to November, November 30th, 2017. I saw him two weeks before, on the 16th, uh, and it was at the Bangkok Post uh, Forum. And he was a speaker uh, before I was. On the, you know, and this happens a lot. You know, in the past, when I go speak somewhere, normally they would have him as a star speaker, and I would kind of like be a warm-up act, right? So I would kind of like... Uh, do an act, and, uh, and then he would kind of uh, swaggers in, and he, in his own kind of way, he, he has a way of winging it, so he never, he doesn't read from scripts, right? Um, but he was larger than life, and I will say that, uh, you know, in the last, the last correspondence I had with him on the line, social media uh, message, he was very concerned about this Buddhist nationalist movement in Myanmar, and he said, you know, Ajahn, we have to, we have to do something about this. This is the, uh, the uh, Mabata movement, uh, you know, 969 movement, and it was a militant Buddhist movement. Uh, he was very concerned about that because they were being anti-Muslim. Uh, Dr. Srin had what, you know, you have the American dream in America. He, he lived what I think could be called a Thai dream from very humble origins uh, without shoes going to school to he, you know, reach his PhD, earn his PhD at Harvard and gone back to many great things in Thailand. Uh, if you Google his name, uh, you'll see uh, in the Wikipedia that uh, my tribute to him uh, was an article I wrote for the Bangkok Post. It was called The Tragedy of Thailand's Rin Pisuan. And it's footnote number eight, I think, or number seven in that Wikipedia. And uh, the point of it was that he was just too good. He was just too good, meaning that uh, he should have become the UN Secretary General in the time he was nominated for it. Um, Ban Ki-moon got it because it's the, the, there was a government change in Thailand and the new government did not support his candidacy. So he ended up being at uh, the ASEAN Secretary General um, and he did a great job. I think he set the bar very high. Uh, this is a, uh, a scholar, politician, practitioner, thinker, intellectual who uh, led ASEAN. He became ASEAN's uh, global face, his you know, spokesman, uh, constant tireless spokesman uh, all over the world. Uh, very flamboyant, very charismatic, you know, and I, I've been advocating to the ASEAN uh, networks that I have been engaged in. Um, you know, what he did was he stretched ASEAN to its maximum, to its potential, by going beyond the non-interference. You know, ASEAN, and I'll talk a little bit about this uh, in, in, in a few minutes, had this cardinal rule that you cannot interfere, you cannot talk about other countries, other members, uh, internal affairs, but he, was, he managed to do a little bit of that. Um, so many things about Dr. Serene I think that we, we miss about him. Uh, I would just say that uh, in addition to everything else, you know, the bottom line, uh, he's uh, left us with three great sons, uh, apart from uh, Fuadi, Husni, also Fitri, and they've all gone to great things, and I think your father would be very proud of you, all of you. Now, um, my talk today um, is about Thailand in a regional space. So at first I was deciding whether to do a PowerPoint, and I think I agree with the people who say that PowerPoint makes us dumber. I don't like PowerPoint. And you know, to be sure that I have a good feedback today, I've uh, been able to uh, pack half the, of the audience with my friends and family. <laughs> so I think that I'll be okay today. Uh, nevertheless, I hope to be able to explain Thailand in a regional fashion uh, over the next hour or so, uh, so that you'll be able to leave here, and I as well, uh, with some, some takeaways about uh, what's happening in Thailand. And Thailand is not unique uh, about what's happening. Uh, we can see trends in Thailand being replicated, multiplied 
proliferating uh, around the world, not least in the US. So first I will talk about Thailand. Um, new and old, old and new. Uh, before I get to it, there's just some, a few facts and figures. Uh, so here's Thailand on a map. So it's a country a little bit smaller than Texas, a little bit larger than California for US audiences. And 70 million people, population, GDP is about 470 billion. Uh, it has a central location in Southeast Asia. So this is the ASEAN space here. We have five mainland Southeast Asian countries, five maritime countries, including Brunei, uh, Singapore, Malaysia here, Singapore, Indonesia, Brunei, Philippines, and then of course Vietnam, Laos, Cambodia, Thailand, Myanmar. Ten countries, Association of Southeast Asian Nations. Thailand is a co-founder, a birthplace of, uh, of ASEAN. Uh, so you can see this region in two ways. It's a, it's a region, but it's also a regional organization. And this regional organization called ASEAN has a, a 650 million uh, market, uh, $2.7 trillion GDP. It's the fourth largest trading partner of the United States, uh, from, apart from Canada, Mexico, and China. So it's a, it's a significant region, and this is a, a, a central country within this region. Thailand's come a long way, it's got a long way to go, but it's changed a lot. So I'm just showing you here a photo of what it looked like in the 1970s with buffaloes and cows, and uh, now full of cars on the same road uh, in the eastern suburb. Just to give you a, a glimpse of flavor of the local landscape. Here's a little soy in Sukhumvit. Those of you who've been to Bangkok, soy nana in 1971, and this is soy nana today with uh, tuk-tuks and uh, you know, lots of taxis and, uh, and bars and pubs and restaurants. Thailand went through the Cold War as a U.S. treaty ally. This was the, uh, the height of the Cold War. Uh, you see uh, a prime minister who was also a military general, Field Marshal at that time, standing between uh, past and current king. Uh, king Pumipon Adunyadet uh, on the, the late king uh, on the right, and then, of course, uh, uh, the current king, uh, present king, the new king, uh, King Mahavacharalongkorn on the left uh, when he was still the prince, uh, crown prince at that time. And this would have been at the height of the, the late 1960s, at the height of the Vietnam War. And the king, this would be about 2015, um, in his twilight, uh, aging, hospitalized. This is in the hospital. Um, so Thailand has, you know, really kind of developed and, and grown up during the reign of, of this, this king, King Pumipon. And I'm skipping one. It should be, is a king? Along the way, this is a photo of Thaksin and the coup. So in my talk, I'll talk about the reign. Uh, king Pumipon oversaw, presided over a seven decade reign. Seven decades, 70 years. That's a long, long time, over three generations. Uh, most Thais who are alive will have been born and, and raised during this reign. Uh, at the same time, I think the reign became challenged by his own success, and the, uh, the, the, the personification, the embodiment of this challenge uh, was this politician, very successful politician, but uh, problematic in some ways, which I'll discuss. And he was ousted in a military coup, in two this was 2006. Along the way, after the king passed, King Pumipon, we had a new king. And this was uh, King Mahavishalarunkon now. Uh, he ascended the throne on December 1st, uh, 2016. And um, in front of him is the chairman of the Privy Council, General Prem, Prime Minister, um, the Privy Councillors. So I'll talk about this uh, in some detail now. Thai politics, all in new uh, elections, coups, and constitutions, uh, new mm -hmm. reigns. New reign means new king. New, newer and new patterns in Thai politics. Uh, I'll look at the poll results from the last election we just had on March 24th. 
and then uh, some of the post-election uh, contours and dynamics, and then political actors, and I'm watching very closely about how they will play this uh, uh, landscape in the, the coming weeks, because I think the next, the next 18 months may well, may well determine how Thailand will be for the next 10 years. So I think it's a pivotal period for Thailand. And then I'll look at Thailand in a regional perspective uh, a bit to give us a, some comparison. Uh, Thailand uh, is exhibiting uh, certain signs that we can see evident in other countries as well. And then to maybe to look at where, where we go from here, where Thailand goes from, from here. You can actually see Thailand, today's Thailand, Thailand today. Starting out here in Cambridge, Massachusetts, with the birth of a king, future king. Um, king Pumipon was born just a short walk from here. And uh, it's been commemorated. Uh, there's a monument, uh, very well recognized. Uh, so if you can take yourself back to 100 years ago, it's in 1912, 1919. In 1919, Thailand had an absolute monarchy, which, means, which meant that the king ruled the country. Um, the secretaries of state and defense and interior and agriculture and all the other cabinet members were relatives and family of the king. Absolute monarchy then became, came under some pressure and it was uh, replaced with uh, a constitution in 1932. 1932. So in 1932, in fact, uh, Thailand's uh, landscape, uh, the monarchy was at a low point. It had just been overthrown. It had been replaced with constitutional rule by a group of uh, up-and-coming, young, uh, civilian, mid-ranking, not even senior, uh, civilian and military bureaucrats, really. Um, in a, and not a very big group, but they, they dared after several failed coups, right? 1912 was the first one, and a series of failed coups succeeded, culminated with 1932. So they kind of replaced absolute monarchy with constitutional rule. Um, 1930s was a tumultuous period. You had fascism in Europe, fascism in Asia. Um, we had a fascist ourselves with uh, a few marshal, few marshal people in some cram, some uh, Paul people in some cram, and he ruled from uh, 1938 to 1944. So in the mid-1930s, the monarchy was at a low point. Uh, in fact, uh, the late king who was overthrown, he abdicated uh, in, 19, in 1935, and uh, they eventually had to find a new king. So they went back to the lineage, right? Kingship is inherited, is passed on through the bloodlines. So it went to King Raman VIII, who was a young boy. He had a brother who, was, who became King Raman IX. They both were young boys studying in Switzerland. So the youngest one, King Raman IX, actually was born, the one who was born here, but he was not king at that time. So in the 1930s and 1940s, China was going through the, the turbulence, the tempest of uh, World War II, fascism, you know, I mean, the whole world went through that. Uh, for Thailand, the monarchy was actually at a very low point. In 1946, after the war, Thailand came out of it relatively unscathed, thanks to the U.S. The uh, U.S. has been very good to Thailand over the years. There's been a lot of bumps in the, in the U.S.-Thai relationship uh, over the last couple of decades. But in 1940s, 50s, 60s, 70s, 80s, and about, up to about 1997, it was rock-solid uh, bilateral relationship. From 1954, it was a bilateral alliance, the U.S.-Thai Treaty Alliance during the Vietnam War, gave rise to, to CETO, like NATO, CETO, Southeast Asia Treaty Organization. 1962, we had a joint communique with the U.S. So the U.S. was very much um, uh, with Thailand, uh, shoulder to shoulder. Of course, Thailand sent troops to fight in the Korean War, in the Vietnam War. We sent a whole division to the Vietnam War. Um, and of course, also helped out with the, uh, the war on terror. Uh, U.S. Thai alliance, very, very deep. Uh, I think is, I would say, dense, thick, and deep uh, over the years. Some problems recently, uh, but that meant that U.S. helped Thailand after the war. You know, so Thailand came out of it rel relatively unscathed. In 1946, you know, new king was a teenager by that time. Came back to Thailand from Switzerland. The war was finished. 
and, uh, and had an accident. So he died uh, from a gunshot wound from an accident. Um, mysterious circumstances. His only brother then became king. This became King Pumipon, who was born here in Cambridge, Massachusetts. King Pumipon, in 1946, on June 9th, ascended the throne, when the monarchy was still marginalized. You know, if you go around Thailand in the 1940s, the strong people were the military people. No civil society, no villages, no middle class. It was really the military, the monarchy, marginalized, limited role, limited visibility. Um, so King Pumipon ascended the throne under those circumstances uh, in 1946. But, you know, he kind of, over the years, and a longevity of decades, not just years. Um, from 1947 to 1997, five decades, he became the pillar of Thai nation building, became the foundation of it. Um, over this period, you know, we had the Cold War. So the Cold War really enabled the reconstruction, the re revival of the monarchy, the monarchy. And I think the monarchy without King Pumipon would not have been revived and kind of rebuilt in that way. Uh, but because King Pumipon himself was hardworking, I think he was uh, uh, devoted to the cause, to his uh, kingdom, kingship, and worked really hard around the countryside. And, you know, I mean, I think this is the reason the Thais uh, revered him, uh, respected him, uh, and appreciated uh, his, his reign because, you know, he, over the years, in the 1950s, 60s, and 70s, when the U.S. was fighting in Vietnam, Thailand was its uh, staging ground. Those were the years of communist expansionism. I used to remember the time uh, that we thought we would become communists. You know, I mean, North Vietnam, 1954. South Vietnam, 1975. Laos, 1975. Cambodia, Khmer Rouge, 1975. When Vietnam invaded Cambodia in, on December 25th, 1978, by the first week of January 1979, I remember as a young boy, a uh, photo on the front page of Thai Rat newspaper with a Vietnamese tank on the border, and we thought we would be invaded by the communists, we would become communists. Um, but thanks to the, the very strong alliance with the US and very strong, what I call a kind of a Cold War fighting machine that grew out of this period of the Cold War, revolving around the monarchy, the military, and the bureaucracy, they became the three main pillars, the three main institutions that, that called the shots and ran the place in Thailand. What they did, two big achievements, they kept communism out. This is, uh, this is you know, in those days, remember in the 1970s, uh, not being a communist was actually a good thing. Look at what happened to Cambodia, for example. And Burma was, uh, you know, kind of uh, autarkic, uh, reclusive. So Thailand was a, not just a last domino, but a, a shining exception in a very hostile communist uh, neighborhood. Another thing that, that was achieved during the reign was economic development. If you look around the region, uh, Thailand over the decades has some time for economic development. It has political stability. It was not communist. Um, so those, I think, are the two main achievements of the reign. Uh, but it also became the challenge of the reign because, you know, after five decades of economic development, right, more people had education. You know, socialization, uh, travel, um, exposure to news, media, uh, ideas, and so on. So they began to want something else. They became more, more audible, uh, more demanding, more conscious of their uh, rights and freedoms. And of course, uh, um, a, a movement uh, from the late 1970s, early, 1970s, early 1970s, late 1960s, call for an opening up of the political space because we had a military dictatorship all through 1947 to 1973. So this became a kind of a movement to uh, oust the military dictatorship in 1973, in the mid-1970s, led by university students, university students. Um, but it was quashed, suppressed uh, in the mid-1970s, very turbulent in Thailand. And you know, in fits and starts, there were some elections that came and went. Um, but didn't stick, you know, Thai democracy was always weak. Uh, the military, the monarchy, the bureaucracy, very strong. This kind of swelled and spilled into the 
1980s, right? 1980s, Thailand had a compromise. And a kind of compromise that I think we're looking for now. But back then, that compromise was based on a power sharing agreement. So Im imagine a country with a three decade military dictatorship. Why would military generals share power? Why wouldn't they want to keep power? They want to keep power. We can see them today. But back in those days, the pressure from below mounted and, you know, to, to keep what they had and, you know, um, coups were becoming uh, less acceptable. During the Cold War, military coups were acceptable. If there was a coup to uh, fight against communism, contain communism, it was very acceptable. In Latin America, in the developing world, in the third world back then, it's called the third world. But by the 1980s, the Cold War was winding down. Um, you know, and the Vietnamese uh, withdrew from Cambodia. And suddenly, I think uh, the winds of change were blowing, and there was a power sharing agreement. The army kept some, civilian politicians had some. There were elections. Um, but, you know, you had a general who was the prime minister, General Prem, for eight years, five governments, three elections 1983, 1986, 1988. And then, uh, eight years, very, you know, steady, stable, semi democracy. Um, some elections, some politicians, but a lot of generals. Prime Minister was a general. Uh, and then more pressure. Uh, 1988 elections, you know, this time a civilian led kind of cabinet and government. Uh, of course, civilian government in Thailand and all governments in Thailand uh, have the, uh, the baggage or the, uh, uh, the image uh, of corruption, graft. And that cabinet in the late 1980s was uh, accused, alleged of, uh, with widespread corruption and it lost some legitimacy. There was a military coup. So I'm just bringing you up to the, the you know, Thailand's been kind of up and down, up and down. We've had 22 military coups since 1932. 13 succeeded, the others didn't succeed. We've had 20 constitutions. This is number 20th. You've had one in, I don't know, since 19... 76 or 1780 something, right? But Thailand's had 20 constitutions in 87 years. 22 coup successful or coup attempts, right? In the same period, 13 succeeded. Now, um, what I'm saying is that it's part of the course. Coups came and went. You know, elections came and went. So did politicians, so did political parties. What did stay with this established political order around military, monarchy, and bureaucracy? By the 1990s, after the coup in 1991, uh, there was a movement to, to overthrow the coup makers in 1991, 1992, uh, in May 1992 in particular. That led to a reform movement Right, in mid-1990s, led to a new constitution. And I'm going to talk about these three constitutions, 1997, 2007, 2017, in a few minutes. But it was a new period of, uh, you know, on the one hand, we had an economic crisis in 1997, which I spent five years studying. Um, but on the other hand, we had political reform in 1997. New constitution, very reform-oriented, more transparency and accountability of the political system, um, more, more effectiveness for, for the executive branch. Uh, we borrowed the different mechanisms from different countries. It was an eclectic constitution in 1997. So the first five decades of the reign succeeded, but it laid this, the southeast seas of its own challenge for the, the last two decades. So the last two decades, what happened? After the 1997 constitution, you had the rise of Thaksin Chinawat, the photo I showed you. His party was formed in 1998. He won all the elections in Thailand since 2001. 2001 in January 2001, one in February 2005, December 2007, July 2011. Four big elections, four general elections. Right? There were two nullified elections in 2006. His party also won. In 2014, 2013, December, his party also won. So, 
you know, elections when it came, the Thaksin parties won. And this became a big challenge to the established order, the military, the monarchy, the bureaucracy, and they didn't have an answer for it. And now they're trying to come up with an answer, but we will see if, they, if this is sufficient or not for what Thailand needs and what Thai people demand at this time. So the elections, and I mentioned a number of coups, so the 2006 was at the 12th coup, successful. 2014 was 13th coup, successful. These two coups were done by the same people, same generals basically in 2006, they were just the regimental commanders, um, you know, uh, regional commanders. Uh, 2014 they became the army chief, same batch, same classmates, um, same cohort. Um, so these two coups were kind of prequel and sequel, one and the same. Uh, they, sometimes they say that they, they wasted the coup in 2006, so they had to do another one in 2014. Um, there was also a judicial dissolution. That's another kind of coup. You know, imagine if the Supreme Court um, of the U.S. dissolved either the Democrat Party, Democratic Party, or the Republican Party. That's what happened in Thailand. So the, 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 the court system, judicial, the constitutional court, dissolved the ruling parties. They dissolved the ruling party the first time in May 2007, the second time in December 2008, on December 2nd, and the third time on March 7th, 2019, recently. Um, what were behind these uh, two military coups, one judicial coup? Well, as I said, they, they established order, the military, the monarchy, bureaucracy. They didn't have an answer for this toxin electoral juggernaut. Well, you had an election in Thailand, he wins every time. And the Democrat Party, I, I, I hold them partly accountable because I voted for them, um, but because also they, they did not work hard enough, uh, they didn't have the, 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 the ideas that were needed, the efforts that needed to be made to overcome the toxic electoral juggernaut. So the answer became coups, right? two military, one judicial, and these coups were really a, a way, a rear guard action, you know, a uh, reaction and what I would call a restoration of the established Thai political order from the 1950s, 60s, 70s, and 80s. Privileging the roles of the military, the monarchy, and the bureaucracy. Each time, you know, politics starts with, well, politics is about, um, it's a struggle for power, right, in different ways. And because power is scarce, only a few people can have it, so everybody fights for it. So in Thailand, in this fight for power, in the struggle for power, you write the rules, right? So if you have a coup, you write rules in order to win the game, to win the election. So the 1997 constitution that was reform-oriented, I mentioned it was eclectic, it's a great constitution, I think, by all accounts. But it was the constitution that enabled Thaksin to rise and dominate. So therefore, it was scrapped with military coup in September 2006. You know, when you have a coup, the first thing you do is scrap the constitution because you just violated the constitution. You can go to jail. So you scrap the constitution first and you write a new constitution. So when you write a new constitution, well, this time in 1997, you know, the idea in 1997 was to once and for all, get rid of money politics in Thailand. Money politics is the root cause, the, the evil in the political landscape. So to, to undo, to extirpate money politics. Money politics, by the way, is, is a business of politics. So, you know, uh, typically, and it's not just Thailand, Indonesia, some Philippines a lot, um, Myanmar a little bit, Cambodia a lot. To run for politics, you have to be a somebody. Or you have to have a somebody who backs you. And that somebody is a, a local influential person in some constituency somewhere. Typically it's a local businessman, sometimes construction. But it could be a mafia boss. You just have you know, some influence, you have some underlings, you have money. You're the local patron, 
The local patron means, you know, when, when things go wrong, the locals come to you. They don't go to the police because the police won't help them. Right? So the, you become the local patron. They run in politics. And then they would buy votes. They would, buy, they would spend money on billboards and things. And, but, you know, but they also will buy votes. And they'll kind of find their way, win the election, and find their way into the cabinet, into government. And then from government, within government, then you try to recoup your investment, what you spent, through the procurement projects. Right? Procurement projects allow you to skim kickbacks, commissions, and then more than offset your investment, you actually make a lot of profit. So that's money politics. So the money politics, in 1997, they tried to get rid of it by you know, requiring politicians to declare their assets, setting up these new institutions, you know, the anti-money anti anti -money laundering, um, anti-corruption, election commission, constitutional court, um, ombudsman, auditor general. So trying to make the political process more transparent and accountable right, to get rid of this kind of buying your way in, recouping your investment with profit. Good constitution, but... 1950s, 60s, 70s, 80s, 90s. Yeah, so 1997 constitution was designed to stop that. It was a good constitution, but Thaksin benefited from the constitution. You know, he rose up to power and dominated, so they got to get rid of the constitution. So 2007, the new constitution, if you want to run, if you can write the rules to run America, what kind of rules would you write? So though, you know, your founding fathers, they wrote rules that have lasted all these years with some amendments. But uh, in Thailand, you write new rules. So from 1997 to 2007, you say, okay. Okay, you have the coup, right? So you have the coup, you scrap the constitution, you write a new one. So a new constitution, you say, okay. Now the Senate will make it half appointed, half elected. Okay, and we'll appoint the half, more or less, the coup makers, the junta, the generals. The other half, okay, we have some election. And then the lower house, we play around with the, the numbers a little bit, the party lists, you know, we have a dual teal constituencies, party lists, so they increase the party list allotment. You know, the, the, the idea was to manipulate the, the rules so that the toxin juggernaut is weaker, so more balance. Nevertheless, when they went to the election in December, on December 23rd, Sunday, 2007, Thaksin's party had been dissolved already in May, on May 29, 2007. His second generation party called the Palang Prachashon Party, you know, People's Power Party, still won by almost a majority, 235 out of 500. Right? The first time in 2001, he won 248 out of 500. The second time in 2005, big landslide. It won 377 out of 500, right? The Thaksin Party became, it set the record, completed a full term, one party government, um, and uh, re-elected. So, so three records they set. Uh, so after they were overthrown, new rules, still won almost by majority. In, December 2007. So these two, you know, you must know about our yellow shirts, red shirts. So the yellow shirts, the ones that uh, protested in the streets and then they overthrew the Thaksin government uh, in 2006, laid the conditions for the coup in 2006. So after they won the election in December 2007, the, the yellow shirts came back in 2008. So they went, you know, they occupied the, 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 the government house, the streets, the, eventually the airport uh, for, for seven and a half days in late November. This is when we had the, the dissolution of the Thaksin Party uh, in December uh, 2008 for, for fraud. Uh, and, and before that, you know, a Thaksin aligned prime minister was disqualified for hosting a cooking show that, and accepting an honorarium for it. Um, so the 2007 constitution didn't work because Thaksin still won. Right? Uh, so they had a coup. Right? The coup produced in 2007, Thaksin people came to power in 2008, so they protested, had the judicial dissolution out. The opposing side took power, the Democrat Party, 2009, 2010. This is when you had the red shirts who protested. You know, when you dissolve a political party in any country, you effectively 
disenfranchise the voters, right? So if you imagine, if you're Republican, Democrat, whatever, if your party is dissolved, you know, you just, you've just been disenfranchised from the system. So this is what happened. 2009, 2010, red shirts came out to the streets. They were suppressed. 2011, time was up. They had to have election. So these elections, now Thaksin was in exile. This, this election was then led by his sister, Ying Luck, right? Ying Luck. So they won the election again in July 2011 by a majority, 265 out of 500. Right. So Ying Luck took power, a Thaksin aligned government. And it looked like you know, Ying Luck was going to last for a while, uh, past the halfway, midway point, right? Uh, despite some protests by the Yellow Shirts. But then in October, um, October 31st, November 1st, 2013, the Yingla government introduced, introduced an amnesty bill, a bill that would exonerate you know, all these political wrongdoings and uh, uh, basically paving the way for people that, on both sides, but including Thaksin, of course, to be exonerated, cleared. Right, legally cleared because he had been convicted, he'd been exiled. And that catalyzed the resurgence of the Yellow Shirt protest again, this time under the rubric of the People's Democratic Reform Committee, the PDRC. So they protested in the streets. You know, Thailand, if you go to Bangkok, you have to check the calendar if they're going to be protesting or not. Because, I mean, you couldn't go around central Bangkok because of protests uh, for seven months. Uh, October for November, December until May 2014. On May 22nd, the latest last coup that we had, the military coup, on that day. So we've had two constitutions, 1997, 2007. So now, this coup, 2014, it was a hard coup. This was a coup to take control directly. Normally, a coup in Thailand, we've had plenty. As I mentioned, it's, a, it's okay to have a coup in the past because it was a kind of a reset. So coup makers would come in, appoint a caretaker government, sometimes with technocratic government for like 15 months or so, 18 months, maybe 12 months, and then they have an election, new constitution. But this time, in 2014, the generals took over directly. It was a time of the royal succession. So in my view, the coup also was not widely opposed. There were pockets of resistance, but not systematic. A lot of people knew that King Pumipon was in the final twilight. And in the Thai system, and in my view, you know, when the military was the midwife of the royal succession, I think there was not a national protest against it because the system was built that way. Military monarchy, symbiotic relationship. So I think General Payut, General Shah, the junta leader, the military council leader, became prime minister. And I think he had, a, he had some, some leeway, I think, ahead of the, of the succession. And the succession did eventually come. Uh, His Majesty the late King passed in the October 2016. Um, and so I thought, you know, to me, that was the expiry of the military coup, uh, military junta, right? But they stayed on and they're staying on. Uh, before then, they had a, they had a, a lot of latitude. Uh, so they wrote the third constitution. Three constitutions in two decades. This is the, um, you know, we, we've been very wasteful with constitutions. Uh, world record, by the way. Three constitutions, two decades. So the third constitution in Islam, since 1997, now they've gone further back. So the Senate now, if you, have, you have senators here, right? They're elected every six years, the House every two years, you know, rotational, very systematic, almost methodical. In Thailand now, the Senate, from half elected, half appointed, now it's fully appointed, fully appointed. In addition, the fully appointed Senate also gets to vote for the prime minister, right? For the prime minister. And then who gets to appoint the Senate? The military government. More or less, directly and indirectly. Directly, they appoint 50. Indirectly, 154. Uh, 250, so 194. And six ex officio, the, the, the services chiefs. So, you know, this constitution, very hard one. And also, they've made, have 
shifted more authority to these agencies I mentioned, Constitutional Court, Election Commission, Anti-Corruption Commission, um, and then playing around with the rules on the proportional representation known as party list and the, direct, you know, uh, the constituency ballot, um, shifting it so that large parties would have a difficult time because if you get a lot of constituency seats, 350, you would get very few or none on a party list. Right? And also writes the rules so that um, small parties would do well or, you know, basically in America you have first past the post. If you run for office and you win, then you assume office and the losers, they go home. The losing votes, they, they, they lose. In the new constitution, in the, in the constitution of 2017 in Thailand, the losing votes are counted for the proportional representation. So you know, the idea is that you divide up all the votes, all votes cast by the number of seats, 500. And then you know, if you get uh, the number is 71,000 this time, based on voter turnout. If you, get, if you run an election as a party, and you get to 71,000 votes nationwide, right? And we have 70 million population, 51 million electorate people who can vote. Um, and we had about a 70 percent turnout, a lot higher than America. I never, you know, the U.S. is, by the way, it's a great democracy, but the voter turnout is always very low. Um, 70 percent in Thailand. Uh, so if you get 71,000 votes nationwide, you get one MP. So there's a big debate now: how many? Parties have one MP because you have to use decimal points, you know. So if you get if you get sixty nine thousand, do you get one MP or thirty five thousand? Not seventy one. Seventy one is a threshold, right? But what if you get ninety two thousand? You get one MP or one point three MP, one point four MP. So this now is a big controversy in Thailand because the rules are written. I mean, the rules were written against something rather than for something. Right? The Constitution in the U.S. you have a Constitution written for for something not just against something. So, I mean, the, the constitution we have is, you know, the, the idea is to keep the big parties from being a juggernaut and dominating um, politics and elections in order to enrich themselves. That's the, that's the design, that's the intention. So this tale of three constitutions has been going backwards. And uh, the, until the last election, same pattern. The taxing party wins, as I mentioned. 01, 05, 07, 11. This time, there's a new pattern emerging. Um, and I'm going to go into it in just a minute. Uh, what we're seeing is a kind of a, and I've been saying this for years now, you know, there's a need to reconcile between the new interests, newer forces in electoral politics with the old interests and older forces within the established order from the Cold War. Right? And they have not been able to reconcile. So there's a new reign, new king, and new, newer politics. Um, I'm keeping my eye very close on this uh, new dynamics. His Majesty King Mahavichara Rongkorn so far, he's been counterintuitive, been very uh, unanticipated. He's made uh, a lot of moves with the Privy Council, with uh, different moves that His Majesty has made that uh, I think a lot of people uh, have not anticipated. They've been very uh, uh, methodical, very... Uh, um, kind of uh, sensible, uh, smart moves that, that uh, His Majesty has made, I think, uh, compared to the time when he was a crown prince. Uh, very different uh, expectations and very different manifestations. In a way, with the new reign, there's a bit of a more level playing field. The playing field was not level before because the yellow side was always a winning side. Because the yellow side had the perceived implicit backing of the monarchy military. Okay. So when you protest in the streets, you know you got a you got special the force is always with them. To look at the Star Wars uh, analogy. They have the force. So they win, they win eventually they win. Uh, this time with New King, hmm, uh, may not be the same. I don't think it's the same. They can't just go out to the streets, assume that they can rally, mobilize, galvanize around the name of the king, uh, because it's a different, different monarch now. A new king and the army, we'll see what kind of relationship they have. I'm looking at this very closely. The big question to me in Thailand 
is a new monarch interested in a legacy? And I think monarchs are interested in legacies. And if new monarch is interested in a legacy, the, the, the late monarch had a legacy, and you couldn't match that legacy of seven decades on the throne, seeing Thailand through the Cold War without becoming communist, enabling economic development in a neighborhood of Burma, Indochina. So Thailand has done very well doing, you know, so his legacy is a kind of a developmental philosophical king, right, for which the nation has been grateful. Now, new king, what kind of legacy? The legacy that would seem to be um, worthwhile at this time would be to get Thailand out of its rut. Thailand has been stuck for 14, 15 years in the same pattern of election, street protests, coup, constitution, election, street protests, coup, constitution, election, street protests, coup, constitution. That's pretty much Thai politics in the 21st century. So to break out of it means election has to kind of stick and coup cannot just happen like that. And a constitution has to be acceptable to the major players the as the rules of the game. And then maybe the system can kind of find some footing, right? find some footing. So uh, if this is a legacy that you know, new monarch, uh, our new king is interested in, um, if the major players are interested in it enough, I think this would be Thailand's breakout of the impasse that it has stuck itself in, it has inflicted on itself. Um, as you know, um, we've had a lot of drama, and the latest drama is associate, associated with the last election. So the last election on March 24th, and you know, election normally, when you have election in America, you have election in any country. Normally the election, we're having one in, in Indonesia coming up, um, India, uh, Australia coming up. Election is supposed to provide some clarity, right? Who is going to be running the place? It provides some mandate, some legitimacy, some policy directions. The election in Thailand on March 24th has made the place murkier. There's no clarity. The election was supposed to provide some closure to the military government. At least you can be the military, you can be in government, but at least you go through an election. Ah, you know, at least you can claim some legitimacy. Um, but that now is in doubt because the, PM, you know, the election commission has behaved in ways that people don't think is credible. And then to, uh, clarity, don't know. The numbers are very close. I'll come to that in a minute. But we had the, the Thaksin party this time. This is the, the worst the Thaksin party has done. Um, it has won big victories. 2001, 05, 07, 11. 11 and 5 majorities. 2005, huge landslide. 70% 70, 70 of the low house. This time, not so well is because of the toxin miscalculations. You know, the king's sister was nominated to be prime minister for the toxin party, toxin line party. And that, had, that was overturned within the same day by a royal command. And then, right before the election, two, less than two days, Thaksin invited the same princess, sister of the king, to a wedding in Hong Kong of his youngest daughter, right? Right before the election. That also was offset by a royal statement to choose good people. And then Thaksin, I think now, I think he might be finished. We might actually be beyond Thaksin finally because his royal decorations from the monarchy have been withdrawn. In the Thai system, when your royal decorations are withdrawn, you kind of become a isolated, ostracized a little bit, an outcast, surely. So I wouldn't be surprised if his party has some realignments and his people who are moderates, maybe they'll have some second thoughts and so on. But uh, that's the tax inside, lowest number that we've had. And these are the numbers. So in Thai politics, in Thai party system, there are only three, three camps, very easy. There's a pro-military 
pro junta, pro prayut, the prime minister, general, coup leader, and the party is called Palang Basharat. And then another party called Action Coalition for Thailand, and that is the, the yellow shirted uh, kind of party, PDRC, from 2013 14. And there's a People's Reform Party. They won 116, 5 and 1 out of 500. The 116, actually, the 116 is higher than expected, higher than anticipated, because of the Hong Kong, thank you, because of the Hong Kong and the nomination gambits. So, you know, Thailand is a country of majority, minority. Majority has ruled and seen as abusive. Min minority has fought back, and the place is at an impasse. Right? When you go to the vote, that's, that's how it's been. So the minority, when they see Thaksin using the royal list, royal card, the sister of the king, to be leader of his party, they got scared. And then the, the hours before the election, they see Thaksin using King's sister again, as a guest of honor at his daughter's wedding, they got very scared. So if you're very scared of Thaksin, meaning that you know, if he comes back, he's going to have a lot of uh, retribution. I think he's got a lot to claim back, to reclaim. His assets have been confiscated. You know, his power has been stripped, and, you know, and uh, he's been exiled, and so on. So he's got a lot uh, to, 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 to take back. And then, of course, uh, his, his rule was also associated with uh, conflicts of interest, abuse of power, and so on. So, you know, his enemies are very entrenched. And, uh, and, and, and pretty wide and deep. They got scared. When you get, you get scared of Thaksin, you don't run behind the Thaksin opponents in the Democrat Party. You run behind General Prayut. That's why Palang Basharat, the military party, did well and better than expected of, because of a late surge. A late surge after the Hong Kong wedding on the Friday night before the Sunday election on March 24th. Um, the anti-junta parties did very well. So these are the Thaksin Aligned Party, you know, the party that nominated his sister, uh, the king's sister, got dissolved on March 7th. Uh, so Thay Cha's dissolution, I think, partly explained why Thaksin's numbers are the weakest this time. Because Thay Cha and, Plank and uh, Pe Thai were designed to complement each other. Pe Thai would win a lot of constituency seats. Thay Cha, you know, to circumvent the rules, so to kind of handle these new rules, manipulative rules, you split your party into smaller parties to get some constituency seats, to get some party list seats. So Thayer Sasha was dissolved, and, and therefore the poor Thai got 137, the lowest number the Thaksin party has, has uh, garnered over the, the year since 2001. Poor Chat, Chat, also a Thaksin aligned party, didn't do so well. Future Forward Party, has shot up from nowhere. This is a party, you don't win election, you don't win seats in Thailand without some name recognition, some veteran MP, some patronage network, some money, right? But this party ran on social media. They went around the country meeting people. They're actually unheard of. I couldn't tell you an MP name from this party, but they won 80 seats, maybe more, depending on how they do the decimals, right? So the Future Forward Party is unbelievable, um, phenomenal, the, 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 tur the turnout. You know, it won uh, almost 7 million votes, popular votes, 80 seats out of 500 from, from nowhere. I mean, it's a brand new party under the leadership of Thanathorn Jung Rung Rungkit and Pia Bhut, um, a, a former lecturer at uh, Thammasat University. And they, they have been charged with some... Uh, uh, but by the authorities, I'll go into that in a minute. But you know, this is an, these are the numbers for the opposition uh, to the military government. So you can see the numbers are very, very strong. So we're going to have a kind of a fractious, weak coalition government. Swing party is Democrat. Pum Jai Thai is known for wanting to legalize marijuana. You might, you might laugh, but actually it's an innovative idea in my view. I mean. In the U.S., you have some states that, that actually have legalized marijuana. Soon there'll be a global legalization and liberalization. And Thailand is pretty good with marijuana. Um, so they got some ideas. So anyway, this party did pretty well. 
but based on patronage networks in the countryside. Democrat Party did the worst that they've done since 1980s. 1992, we had two elections. They, did, they got more than MPs in this in March and in September. So we have a lot, we, had, we, need, we need you guys to go back and run the party. And you know, they have to clean house. And I think that, uh, you know, a problem with Thailand, and maybe a problem with America a little bit, America less so, is a country run by old people. And Thailand has a big conflict. It's a conflict among the old people. If you look at, if you, if you take the, the names of these people who run Thailand, right? You put them on the table, and you look at the birth dates, they're over 60, they're over 70s. The judges who like dissolve these parties, the average age is like 77 or something. If you cut off the date, the birth dates, to 40 and below, this is Thailand's future. So the future forward party benefited from presenting itself, positioning itself as a third force. Out of this conflict, no yellow, no red, enough of this. And I can see why a lot of young people, if I were like that young, you know, uh, former students here, uh, you've seen the last 15 years being wasted in Thailand. Right? So young people must be thinking, hey, if the next 15 years are like this, my life's gone. Right? The best of my life, anyway. And so I think that they have taken matters into their own hands more. They voted for, uh, many of them voted Future Forward. So, you know, this is a country that I think the younger voices are speaking out and they need to be more empowered. And if that happens, that's a good sign for Thailand. You can see it from here. Um, so the Democrat Party, I think the older generation still won't go away. And the younger voices, I, I noticed, you know, the young people, they don't have to be Democrat. They don't have to be a future forward. If you take young people, 14 below, from all parties in Thailand, and you eliminate the 50 or 40 and above, from all parties, <coughs> sorry, um, Thailand would be a much better place. <laughs> I, 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 I'm sure. Because all this conflict, everything that we see in Thailand is be, uh, between the old people. Taksin, Prayut, Taksin is about 72, right? I mean, Prayut is 66, 67. And all these other generals, all the judges are over, most of the judges are over 70s, the senior judges. But they run the place. So the Democrat Party, I hope they have some cleaning up to do, and I hope that uh, we can vote for them again, um, that they'll be appealing to vote for again, um, starting with, you know, with young people taking over, okay? Uh, now, good news is that the older parties, based on the Chat Thai Patana, Chat Patana, I mentioned the patronage networks from the past, they didn't do so well. They held their ground, but in fact, they didn't hold their ground. Um, they got some, you know, some MPs in their strongholds, but they didn't do well in the surrounding provinces. So this is a good sign. There's a brand new party emerging, Future Forward, and older parties are not, have not done so well. Uh, and that's something that Thailand can take into the future. Post-election, I want to uh, leave some time for Q&A. Uh, there'll be a lot of controversies, uh, squabbling, and then we'll see some kind of a military bulldozing its way into power with the help of the Senate, 250 senators will, will support them, presumably. But there will be a legislative deadlock because, you know, you can, you can form a government, but you can't govern. Right? You can get 250, 500 bicameral. The bicameral, bicameral majority is 376. So you can get that because you got 250 to begin with. But when you legislate, you govern, it's only in the lower house of 500. So in the US, it would be 435. The Senate does not get involved in lawmaking in Thailand. So, you know, you need 250, 260, 270, really. But the opposition will have at least 220, 230. So we're talking about a fractious, kind of weak government. And then we'll see, I think, that all roads will lead to a constitutional crisis because that's where the, the source of all the problems are. When you have a crooked set of rules, you know, favoring this this way, manipulating that that way, you know, the game is not going to be played right. Um, some political actors to watch: New Monarch, and and but the tricky analysis in Thailand is that you know you have on the one hand New Monarch, on the other hand you have the old guard. So I mentioned the seven decades, right? 
So in seven decades of the long reign, you have the military, the monarchy, the bureaucracy. So they, they have some insiders, right? insiders among these institutions that are really the, they comprise the old guard, all privy councillors, some the, all the generals, some of the senior bureaucrats, the judges, and so on. So this is old guard. But you have new king. The old guard came from the previous king, the late king, but there's a new king. So how the new king will work will relate, interact with the old guard. That's how Thailand is going to be shaped. And then there's an army, navy, air force, police. I put them just separately because the air force and police and army and navy, are, they seem to not be as active and assertive as the army. Privy council, very important in Thailand, judiciary, I mentioned, the senate, pro-military, military appointed. Civil society divided, but have some role. In the end, there will be pro-military, pro-junta parties, forces, anti-junta parties, forces. International community has a big role to play, and so do investors, international investors. Thailand is not alone in having these dilemmas and uh, predicaments and challenges. Uh, you can see this happening in a search for a balance between being a kingdom and democracy in a problematic neighborhood. You, know, you see authoritarianism uh, deepen, deepening uh, and populism also widening in, in Southeast Asia. Cambodia, um, can the Cambodian National Rescue Party, this could be what Thailand can be looking at. This is the opposition party in Cambodia. Cambodian, Cambodian National um, Rescue Party, CNRP. It's been dissolved. And the leader of the party, jailed. And the other leader of the party, exiled. So now there's a fight back. I think the, the CNRP is organizing. Um, I, 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 I have had some communications. They will try to go back to the country this year. Uh, and they will have a, some kind of their own reckoning. So Thailand has its own reckoning. Cambodia, if the opposition asserts itself and try to go back to the country, we will have to see what the Hun Sen government will do. Um, Philippines, you know, when I get to the, la the final point, I'm going to say that uh, Thailand is in grave danger of falling in the footsteps of the Philippines. When you have 15 years of crisis, right? 15 years of you know, coups and constitutions and elections, you at a standstill. The economy expands a little bit, you know, not contracting, but you're not going anywhere. Stand still, when you're at a standstill these days, it means that you're falling behind. If you were in Manila in 1960, you would think that the Philippines was very advanced, very modern. Thai people wanted to get their graduate degrees from the Philippines in the 1960s. Then the Philippines was mismanaged by an oligarchy for three decades, and then it kind of stagnated. Stagnation is Thailand's biggest risk. So going forward, Thailand, you know, at least Philippines is a country of islands. I think geography matters a lot. U.S. is blessed because it has this big land surrounded by two big oceans. The land is very, very well endowed, very rich. And so the land is really the source of the U.S. wealth and power, in my view. Um, Thailand also has good land, good size of land, as I said. A little bit bigger than California, a little bit smaller than Texas, well endowed. It has a critical mass of a market. It's got a good location in the Southeast Asia lands landscape. Um, so I think that uh, this is really Thailand's saving grace, but there are limits to it. There are limits to it. You can see that uh, you know, there's been a lot of infrastructure development, north, south, east, west, uh, in mainland Southeast Asia. Thailand is the center of it. You can see um, there's a road I've driven on from here all the way to, to central Vietnam. There's going to be more roads. And the Belt and Road Project, the uh, Belt and Road Init Initiative of China, the Belt and Road Initiative doesn't cover mainland Southeast Asia. Mainland Southeast Asia would be covered under the, one of the six corridors the corridor that is mainland Southeast Asia, they call it the China Indochina Peninsula Economic Corridor. That also will be a big boost for, for infrastructure development uh, in mainland Southeast Asia. Despite all these problems in Thailand over the last 15 years, it has managed to build a monorail system around Bangkok. So there's some continuity there. 
Um, last slide. Uh, finally, I would just say where Thailand goes from here, there's a risky interim until 9th of May. May 9th is when the official election results will be announced. Uh, the baseline scenario will be that General Bayut will lead, will bulldoze his way into a military-supported, Senate-assisted, uh, weak coalition government. Um, but there is some, there's a growing, a little bit of a likelihood that could be growing, that some other scenarios that uh, could lead to an outsider being leader of the government, outsider meaning not General Bayut, uh, could be a national government. So one of the best case scenarios for Thailand, one of the best case scenarios for Thailand, um, based on a, the flawed constitution that I mentioned, is a kind of a reset. You know, Thailand needs a reset. Is, is it so wound up? It's, so, it's like a Gordian knot. So a reset it has to be, the rules have to be rewritten. How do you do that? Well, you can't amend the rules, the constitution inside the parliament, because they write it so that you need two-thirds majority. But one-third is already military, the Senate. So if there's a national unity government of some kind, I would take that to be a very good sign. This would tie it in with my earlier point about a legacy, a legacy that would lead to a breakout somehow of this cycle of coups and constitutions and elections. Um, so the constitution will have to be revamped uh, somehow. If that happens, then I think we can see something, something very positive, something promising going forward. The economy, there's some decoupling, meaning that Thai politics is very turbulent, very volatile, but the economy keeps expanding about 3% a year over the last 15 years. Uh, well, so I think that will continue because of Thailand's space in the mainland Southeast Asia, the central role is the hub. Uh, the, the, the economic policies from this government, the EEC, Eastern Economic Corridor, Thailand 4.0, economic upgrading, I think that will be also maintained with some modifications, even if governments change. Thailand is in search of a new balance. The balance we had in 1970s, 80s, 90s, no longer holds. That balance was premised on the established order of the military, the monarchy, the bureaucracy. The old interests, the old guard. Now there's a new monarch, there are new voices, there are new interests, political parties, political forces associated with electoral rule. So they have to find somehow a new balance. Um, I have, uh, I'm less pessimistic than I used to be, but it depends on the day. Sometimes I'm, <laughs> you know, um, it depends. And I see the, what's going on. Some days I'm like, okay, you know, going, finally maybe something good, but then, then my hopes are dashed the next day. Um, but I'm less pessimistic because I, I've been analyzing Thailand through this cycle of coups and constitution and elections and the yellow shirts and red shirts. I'm so sick of it, sick and tired. Uh, you have a journalist friend here, uh, and you know, you know this very well, Simon, that uh, same old you know, coups, constitutions, elections. But this time, I think, with the new monarch, with the new reign, Thailand could break out of it with a, new, with a compromise and a new understanding. New understanding means new rules. New understanding means that we play a game and you know, if you lose, you don't break up the game. You, know, you play until we, we reset the game and then we'll play again. Um, this has not happened, but it could still happen. Uh, we've been, you know, the depths of the crisis have been so abysmal that I think there's a lot of space to go up. And if Thailand can get its act together just a little bit, have elected regular elected government with some policy directions that are clear, it's got a good, it's got a good thing going. It's got a good location, good people, hardworking, very resourceful. Um, it's got a critical mass. It's very attractive. A lot of investors who talk to me about, you know, investors and diplomats, they can't do without Thailand. I mean, Thailand is a, a key piece of the jigsaw of the Indo-Pacific, for example. Um, so it's got a lot of things going for it. Uh, so far, it's been shooting itself in the foot. But going forward, I'm less pessimistic. Uh, it will depend a lot on our new king, 
on the old guard, on the army, on the new forces, new political forces. The future fort now is being investigated. It might be dissolved. The leaders of the future fort might be banned, might, go, might be jailed. If that happens, I'll take it as a very bad sign. You dissolve any party, you be, you're basically disenfranchising people. Future Four is not a small party. It's got over, you know, 6.8, 6.8 something million people who voted for it. Uh, they might stay home or they might go out to the streets. Um, the military, the army, not just the military, but the army and the all guard, they have a lot to, to lose. But to keep as much as what they've had, as much as possible, they have to make some concessions. And I think concessions mean a, a kind of compromise. Otherwise, Thailand will risk, and I mean it. And you know, I'm looking around Cambridge or UK, Cambridge, Massachusetts, UK, UK, um, you know, for, for contingency plans. Um, <laughs> it might not be a, a pleasant place, conducive place to live if it is stuck for another 15 years of coups and constitutions and elections. If it stands still f for another decade, it will mean stagnation and it will look like the Philippines. So I don't think we'll get there somehow, uh, but we all have to have contingencies. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Maybe we have time for a few questions, I think. Ajahn? Ajahn, maybe yeah, a please, few questions? Please, 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 as many okay, as you so, like. Okay, um, so what we'll do is we'll take uh, a few questions together. And if you would do three things for us, identify yourself, be brief, and end with a question mark. Um, and we'll try to get as many as we can. We'll do a first batch, and we have a, a microphone um, out there. So questions? Uh, thank you. I'm Simon Montlake, the journalist that uh, Ajahn kindly uh, indicated. Thank you very much for your, your speak, Ajahn. Um, my question is quite simple. It is, um, uh, is the new monarch the only person with the authority to uh, break this deadlock and create this new balance? And it, if not, then you know, it, does it all depend on, on, are we all depending on one person? Or is it more a, fa a factor of the people around him or the structures? Like, are we, are we sort of <laughs> almost a deus ex machina in this story uh, scenario that you've painted? Is, is, is it that simple or, or, or maybe not? Thank you. Mm. Thank, Thank you. you. You had your hand up? Oh, OK. okay. Two, three. OK. Yes. Robert Rosenberg and uh, advised policymakers. Uh, wonderful talk. You mentioned uh, the people who are under 40 years. Could you talk a little bit about them in terms of education, economic issues, and how they see the, the, uh, their lives? What do they want? Three and then four. Hi, thank you, Ajahn, for the wonderful talk. Uh, my name is Art Prapar. I work at Oxfam here. I'm one of the under 40 Thais who are uh, <laughs> living and, and, and working here now. Uh, I have two quick questions. One is on the old guard and the old power that you have talked about. I noticed that you haven't uh, touched upon another political actor, which is very powerful, which is the business elites and the conglomerates, uh, who seems to be forking the allies with the old power, although with the new monarch and the new strategy. How are they coming into the picture in terms of making sure you know, the new balance and stability would be part of the interest for the economic and the business model that they are running? You know, how, how do you think they are sort of um, uh, favoring the, the balance here? The, the, the second question is about the new power. Do we have a sustaining strategy for the new forces of Thailand or as the future forward parties and the political forces that are emerging as a result of the recent election? Uh, how do you see that? plan out in terms of sustaining that new power that, that has been accumulated. Thank you. Thank you so much, Ajahn. Um, so my name is Amy, from, uh, stu Thai student from MBA Harvard Business School. So my question is related to business. Um, so as a, like, someone who 
plan to return to business community in Thailand, what would there what would be the roles of business community if there should be any um, that in your perspective that we can do without if like actually going into the politics ourselves? Um, thank you. And maybe from over here, so I'm not discriminating. Anybody from either the right wing or the left wing, depending on how you okay. Maybe one more from okay, please, Mala. Thank you very much for your talk. Um, I'm Mala. Um, my question I, I just concerns how the dynamics that you've um, you've shared with us um, impact the everyday kind of lives and practices of Thai people. Um, I, I remember an uh, editorial that you wrote a few years ago. You were talking about um, you use this phrase, which I've um, has really stuck with me. Um, you said that Thailand is undergoing this spectacularly chilling militarization. Um, how 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 do we trace that in, in people's everyday lives? You know, I think of the counterpart in the U.S. Um, we're we're um, concerned about um, the war on terror. We you know we we are thinking about safety all of the time. How does militarization become um, lived for for Thai people? Um, and then also, um, could you could you speak a little bit about? Um, you know, with with the big institutions discredited from um, ele from elections to um, democratic transition to um, perhaps the biggest institution in the country also being um, you know losing some of its shine, um, could you speak about what um, concepts ties use to think about legitimate power today? So your um, challenge, Ajahn is uh, about five minutes for five, or maybe nine questions, depending on how you count. We can ask the Electoral Commission to tabulate. But um, if you can try to address these at least at, at one level in about five minutes, thank you. OK, I will not get into the decimal points. Um, the last question, we'll have to talk over dinner. I understand you're becoming a dinner. Uh, it is very conceptual and very kind of uh, even theoretical about institutions and, uh, uh, and power and legitimacy. The, um, I'll go backwards. The, the, the chilling militar militarization. Um, did I write that? I wrote that. Mm. Uh, what I meant uh, is true. I mean, I, I, I still would stand by that today. It's the politics of, of fear, right? So um, I've been uh, force-fed uh, a, a heavy dose of Fox News over the last couple of days. So this means that, you know, Fox News is blaring. And uh, so I listen to Fox News a lot. These guys, you know, Sean Hannity, these other guys, you know, they have five at five or whatever. So I think, wow, <clears throat> they're really into it. It's really deep. It's really one-sided. And it talks a lot about security. Right? These are the border, the border, you know, these are people coming from Latin America, and you know, so this is really a U.S. kind of uh, absorption now. Uh, I thought, okay, so they, you know, it's similar in that way, the, about fear, national security, so the future forward party leader has been accused, charged for sedition, and sedition is based on what he, what did he do? He, he tried to help a guy who was protesting against the coup, right? So we're seeing kind of a, a new kind of securitization uh, in Thai society. And then militariza militarization, the role of military. Um, you know, there's a military, there's an army of social media people. You know, do you give the military five years to rule? What do you think will happen? Uh, it gets more militarized. So education, uh, a lot of some of the rituals, a lot of the policies, the military budget, more than doubled over the last decade. Uh, weapons procurement completely opaque. Uh, so the military is pervasive. Uh, and if you give this another five years, well, you know, in Burma they had that from 1962 until 2011. <coughs> um, and the military will then, they might increase the draft, the conscription. Uh, we, you know, future forward is that frontal enemy of the military. They want to abolish the draft. They want to reduce the military budget, reduce the generals, and so on and so on. So they want to undo the coup. They want to change the constitution, and therefore sedition, security. 
national security because he, he talked to more than 10 people. Right. Um, so uh, that's on a society level. I think uh, you leave it long enough, uh, you know, there's more censorship and so on. It affects social fabric. Uh, it depends how long it, it, it goes. Uh, I want to get to the other, and I can elaborate a little bit more. We can have more interaction on that, on that note. Um, from the Harvard MBA student, related to the, uh, the business elites question, I'll take those as two. Uh, the business elites, yes, they, they, you know, Thailand has been calculated by, I think it's Credit Suisse, as a, the number one unequal country in the world. Uh, now, I'm, I haven't seen the, the, the methodology and the data. It's certainly very high. Uh, inequality is very high. And the rich poor gap is persistent, it's, uh, it's even deeper. And it could be that the last five years, the top few conglomerates, you know, pie has been growing a little bit at a time, right? But the margins, the value added has come from, has, co has gone to the largest conglomerates. And, you know, one makes a lot of agri-foods, agri the other makes some uh, beer and alcohol, um, and they seem to get favorable terms from the government, and the beer alcohol patriarch also bought the land of the prime minister, the general, for uh, what looked like a higher than market price. So business elite is very important, and I think uh, for the MBA student, and to the other question, um, Future Forward proposes something that they don't like to, which is to favor smaller, more medium businesses. I mean, the wealth is really concentrated, and the wealth growth is concentrated among the largest business conglomerates. Um, and you know, we have to uh, decentralize and devolve that a little bit more. We have to spread it around a little bit more, and that can be done through taxation. So you know, you get an MBA from Harvard, and you go back to Thailand, and you become an investment banker or whatever executive. Uh, don't oppose uh, a fiscal reform. Uh, you know, to spread the wealth a little bit more, um, and then you know, pay more taxes, and then and, and, and you know, so uh, that that's one thing you can do. Um, and there's a party now. There's a party vehicle proposing just that. So that kind of party, that kind of vehicle, that kind of platform can be broadened and supported from below. Um, new power forces. Uh, so I think that the, there are new voices being heard, and this is why I think Thailand is also stuck because a lot of the people who are have been peripheral, who have been marginalized, right? They, they got some access to the system during the taxing years, right? So they get some kind of sense of upward mobility, as a, a, maybe a perceived sense of the pie sharing. Well, you know, if they can get a, a bigger role, a bigger entry, uh, that would be a way to address the, the rich, poor wealth gap in Thailand and the business elites is in their interest uh, you look at the Philippines, there was not enough sharing, so they, they became an oligarchy. So, you know, Thailand can become an oligarchy like that. It is a little bit now, uh, but if it does, in the long term, it's against their own interests. So I think you have to persuade the, the big business in Thailand that it's in their interest to share a little bit more for their own good in the long term. Um, Strategy for new parties, uh, no, brand new party. And this is your question, Art. I think uh, Future Forward is a new phenomenon, and I think it might be quashed. Uh, if it's quashed, uh, nipped in the butt, uh, we have a lot of tension, because a lot of people are behind the Future Forward party. They're a national party. They won in every region except the south and the northeast. They won in Bangkok, I think, eight seats out of 30. So it's a national party, a lot of supporters. Um, I'll get to uh, the, the under 40s. This is a good question. So I've been teaching, I've been in the university business teaching uh, 26 years, um, not including the five years I took from the scholarship from here. Uh, you imagine the people like these guys? So I'm in between, you know. Uh, I, I can kind of adjust, adapt to the technology, but not great at it. You know, you give it to my 16-year-old daughter, you know, she does whatever she does very quickly. So these, these younger people, they've been socialized, they've been exposed to a whole different world. So I think they have very different expectations. 
And they line up, a lot of them line up behind the Future Forward Party. Future Forward Party, they didn't have the traditional campaign coffers and so on. They did a lot of social media. They did go out around the country to, to rally voters and so on. And I think people are now looking for a third way, for a way out of this impasse, to break out of this crisis and cycle. So, uh, so they will be more educated. They will be social media savvy. Um, they have a cyber world. Uh, they get a lot of information, not from the traditional media, the TV and radio, which is kind of controlled by the state in Thailand. The state, in fact, owns most of the TV and radio uh, waves. So this is really uh, the, the future. Um, more education, better educated, um, different aspirations. So I mean, I, I see them and think, well, that's the future, you know. Um, the last question, I think, uh, on the new monarch is a good, a good one to be the last one. So I mentioned earlier about Orgard, the Cold War, military monarchy, bureaucracy, the OA elites, insiders, judges, generals, senior bureaucrats, um, the people around him. The new King is untested, uncharted territory. Um, so we don't know how that will work out. If it's not going to be like a black and white you know, clash. It'll be kind of like a, some reform, some change, um, some interaction, I think some handling. Uh, so I'm looking for a rebalance. The old guard, less. New monarch inherited a very strong monarchy. Uh, that also will have to be reconciled with popular rule. Um, democratic forces. So we're looking for a kind of a, a new rules of the game, new understanding, uh, and some kind of reconciliation and compromise. And if we don't get that, uh, we'll just get this kind of protracted cycle on and on. Thank you. I think that uh, yeah, Howard yeah, wants to yeah. go. Um, thank you very much for um, coming such a long way, especially during um, Songkran, the Thai New Year, to share your insights with us. Um, so please join me in thanking Ajahn Titinan. Also, if you would please join me in thanking the wonderful team from the Asia Center that helped organize all this. Holly back there, Tenzin, I don't know what Jorge is. Lovely, uh, talented student assistant, Montita, thank you very much. And if you're really interested in the topic, the same room, one week from today, same room, same time, we're going to have a panel called Co-Optive Engagement challenges to democracy in Southeast Asia. So if you're interested in some of these comparisons, we will have a panel talking about Thailand again, Indonesia, it's the day after the Indonesian election, and the Republic of the Philippines. So if you want to hear more, come back next week. Thank you very much.